here in another state, if we can help, call us. Um, it'll be a confidential call. We'll direct the person to where they need to go. We care that much about relationships because we know, just as Cheryl said earlier, one person can get healthy, changes a marriage, changes a family, changes community, changes, I and mean, truly one person can change so many things. So please, if you know anything about that, if that's a you know that we can help, please let us know. Yeah, um, so that's a perfect segue. Two, two, uh, two words I always use with couples, if you could think of two frameworks that you work out of when you're relating to anyone, and that's appreciation and curiosity. So when you're curious, you're not assuming. When you're curious, you are interested. When you're curious, you are open. Um, and appreciating, you know, we talk about um, what's the key to happiness. Uh, the key to happiness is gratitude and appreciating. So it's a, it is indicative of a whole different mindset. It's saying, I recognize you, I notice you, I am seeing what is present rather than focusing on what isn't. And it's these simple things that are, are really, truly transformative. I'm sure they want to get to the dopamine part. Yeah. Passion, so, <laughs> okay, so how do we do that? Part? Yeah. So if we think, again, intimacy, there's physical intimacy, emotional intimacy, and then we think of passion. Passion is this, this dopamine kind of infused, adrenaline, endorphin infused state. It's a physiological state. So one of the more common questions that Laura and I get in the office is, um, how do we reignite the passion in our relationship? And so, you know, surprisingly, if we look at it from a biologically based perspective, there are some very simple things that we're able to do. Um, if we think about passionate love, so it's new, it's exciting, it's fresh, there's mystery to it, so if you think that we call it the honeymoon phase, if you will, of a relationship, but on average, passionate love starts to decline after about 18 months. So if at that point now, you are really getting to know your partner, you're understanding their routines, what they like, what they do, you've kind of settled in, you're not, you know, the, the newness is worn off, there's a, but there's a familiarity, which is also, you know, intimacy building and a comfort <laughs> But it also inversely works with, with passion. So the newness that fuels passion is what decreases. So we've got to focus on recreating, almost tricking our body, if you will, into re-experiencing the newness in our relationship. So it is interesting to know that physiologically, our bodies would not be able to tolerate 24/7, the increased arousal state that comes with passion. It, it would be it would be system overload. So we're not designed to do that. But it's more of a companion love. Okay, that happens. It is it it happens with friendship. It happens with support and intimacy. So those are great things, but they also have can counter uh, effect the passion. So we want to keep both. Um, we want to keep both in our relationship. Yeah, and the newness, you've heard people say, or maybe not, but people have great sex when they go on vacation. Yep. Why? Because it's new, it's different, it's more exciting, yep. and it's like, it can be challenging, it can be fun, and like all the mystery yep. of that. So again, passionate love is the love of arousal, excitement, newness, and mystery. It happens at the beginning of a relationship on an average passionate love decline after 18 months. So that kind of, again, normalizes just a, a, a a, um, I think a, a, a developmental and a physiological progression of a relationship rather than going to one of our myths, which is that we always have to have romance and, and passion. It, it, it's something that we again have to you know, work at, we have to be intentional about. And this can feel really good because it feels really safe, it feels very comfortable, it feels it's unconditional love. And when unconditional love occurs again, testosterone goes down, our, our oxytocin goes up, so we're feeling good, so we're feeling okay. Like life is safe and no problems. And that's where we have to be mindful in relationships that we need the excitement to create the passion. So I'm gonna talk about six tips, and again, they don't require a lot of uh, time, money, um, and sometimes not a whole lot of effort. And you know, oftentimes um, what couples fail to realize, and Laura and I discuss this all the time, it is, it is not the monumental 
um, every once every blue moon things that break down a relationship or build up a relationship. It is the little ways every single day that we either choose to turn into our relationship or we turn away from it. So the good news, uh, well, bad, bad news is that if you know it's the little things that you don't think are a lot that can, <coughs> that can kind of teach, uh, construct a relationship. But the good news is it's also the very little things that rebuild it. So we so often have. You know, couples come in and some of the, the feedback and the example that Laura gave, I think, was great. You know, these little ways every day that we can turn into our relationship really are transformative. So uh, these six tips, um, I think we'll, you'll, they're interesting and they're biologically based. And so I think you're understanding now why it's important. That is how we recreate the natural passion, um, elevated endorphin and dopamine levels that we have at the beginning of a relationship. And again, the difference between men and women, one thing is that if a man gives us 12 roses or if he does one, we're going to get the same hot mm -hmm. So if he gives us one rose a day, we'd be just as happy when he gives us 12 if it's the strongest. And again, if the job is for men to have us be happy, knowing these little tips, we yeah. So the first, first one is engage in a new activity. So trying something new sparks excitement, right? Produces passion and mimics the feelings that you had at the beginning of your relationship when because everything was new in the beginning I mean you know everything was something to learn and every experience you had was a new shared experience so it could do it could be anything salsa dancing hiking a mountain or something again simple just eating at a different restaurant I mean I joke with my husband I said we are in this like five mile radius <laughs> rut of our house and I'm like if you would think going to Oprah was the other end of the world <laughs> <laughs> like uh, you know you know it, us going to a different restaurant off the beaten path, we, there's a, just a whole, there's a different energy. There, it, it's something as really simple as that. And something exciting like a roller coaster ride, or I mean, that kind of excitement too can be spark it. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. We'll talk about that. So, <clears throat> it's doing novel or new activities helps you to recreate and re experience the feeling of newness that you had at the beginning of your relationship. Number two, add the element of mystery and surprise. So again, both mystery and surprise mimic the emotional state of a new relationship. Uh, as we talked about, the little gestures go a long way. It could be um, a post-it note on the bathroom mirror that says, I love you, have a good day, or I, I'll, be, I'll be thinking about you today, or, or good luck. It could be, um, you, know, you get a card in the mail, from, from your spouse. Imagine that, it's hard to maybe not an email or, or, or a text. And what the women are going to do is like, we're going to tell people that. We're going to talk to them. So you know what my husband did today, and we're going to get very excited to wonder if he's going to do it again. So we get kind of excited for what's going to happen. Yeah, what comes Just next. the little, again, the oxytocin yeah. goes up, yeah. and we get it happy. Number three, do something that kicks up your adrenaline and arousal. Again, this is this is from a physical slide. Mm -hmm. um, it's <clears throat> you know again physiologically based. So we want arousal general <coughs> activities that can include exercising, going on a hike, a roller coaster ride, um, parachuting out of a plane, or <laughs> now, even even while watching a scary movie. So that's it. I certainly say I don't particularly love scary movies, but I am definitely physically elevated when I'm watching one. So the idea here is that arousal generating activities, again, um, recreate and trick the brain into thinking that the activity that you're participating in, if it's with your spouse, is attributed to the relationship and your spouse. You know, so you go on a roller coaster ride with your partner and you're like, oh my god, that was so, that was so cool. I will never go uh, parachuting, but I have heard from people who will, but you know, it's the same kind of thing. Again, uh, something that gets the endorphins, the adrenaline going, it, it actually tricks, it tricks the brain a little bit. Um, I had a, a husband and wife in my office and they were, again, as many couples do, were just kind of talking about the staleness of the relationship, you know, just the kind of the hump that gone out of it. And so this tip I gave them kind of incorporated a few of these here, and uh, I suggested something new, which is that they start incorporating exercise into their life, and it was something that they were going to do together, 
And so they started uh, working out and exercising at home. And it was activities that, again, were endorphin arousal producing. And it really shifted their connection and the, the physical passion as well as the emotional intimacy in their relationship as well. So take a mini vacation, I'll talk about this a little bit, um, just the two of you. <clears throat> so the idea here, I mean, if it could be overnight, that's great, but you know, sometimes we all can't get away from our life. But the idea is, it is taking time away for just the two of you to get out of the house. So it's somewhere that would interest both of you. Again, it would ideally if it's somewhere new, if it's somewhere different. Um, I had one um, husband, he kind of did this and, and he planned it as a surprise. So that was hitting absolutely all marks. Um, you don't have to go far, you don't have to spend a lot of money, but the key is, is that you're spending time away together, um, uh, away from the home, and I'll tell you why. Because women, research shows um, that women um, actually do far better at feeling passionate, dopamine levels go up when they're out of the home because women have a hard time compartmentalizing when they're at home. They're thinking, well, I have to pay the bills and I gotta make the kids lunches and I have to do the laundry and oh my gosh, that pile has been sitting there in the kitchen and I've gotta take care of that. And all the while now the husband's like, well, you know, what, what, you know what's going on? So women do far um, better off um, at, at recreating these things and being in a mindset when they are outside of home because now they're <coughs> singular focus. You know, what uh, Laura was talking about earlier, I mean, I have, I have couples come in and they really do believe that a vacation is going to cure their marriage because they keep going back, gosh, oh, remember that vacation? Oh, that was so nice, you know, we could do that. And they're talking about how great they were, how nice they were, but um, we can't, you know, we're not building a marriage on a trip to the Mediterranean or a, you know, nice. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't hurt. Um, <laughs> but, you know, to, I always say that type of stuff is um, without the substance foundation of a healthy relationship is like dropping a brick in froth it goes straight to the bottom there it's nothing to hold it up otherwise uh, you know uh, trips like that is like the cherry on top of the whipped cream on top of the frosting on top of the cake on top of the crust so well what you have to build up well, what couples tend to do if it's if the dopamine goes up let's say on a, an exciting vacation and they come home and it's bland again they can create drama like there's some drama that can be created that just to try to get that back up and exciting, but it's really problems that they tend to do. Right. So again, it doesn't even have to be an overnight, but it could be a night away out of the house. Again, um, something new, something exciting, um, something that's different that's again recreating the novelty. So a touch more often, talking again about oxytocin, we're talking about the power of touch. So touch produces arousal, comfort, and support, both physiologically and psychologically. <coughs> it doesn't have to be much of a touch. It could be simply holding hands on a walk. Um, it could be a kiss hello, a kiss goodnight, a hug, sitting next to each other um, on the couch and just, you know, your arms are brushing. It could be sitting on the couch and, you know, you have your, your feet on your partner's lap and they're just kind of, just the, the something soothing, connecting, and comforting, and again, it, it, it is engaging um, our biology. So, um, little things, walking by, just, you know, hey, how are you doing? Or, you know, just a little comforting um, pat, it, the little ways. And I can't stress that enough. I want you guys to walk out of here understanding that it's just gonna be the little, little shifts, the little ways every day that are going to actually make a really big difference. Um, having fun together, play, you know, um, for, for those of you who have kids, you know, if you think about when your kids were little, they had play dates. I mean, it was even incorporated into the door. It was play. Everything that they did was centered around this idea of having fun. Somewhere along the way, I don't know, it's, we, we, we lost the spontaneity and our ability to see the value in just plain old having fun. So by engaging in mutually enjoyable activities, you'll feel more connected to your partner and maintain a more intimate relationship. So couples can play in a lot of ways. Um, I have one couple, um, just actually, um, not this winter, but the one before that, um, I told them to go out and you know build a snowman and have a snowball fight. So it's something simple, it's, it's right there. It's doing a puzzle together, it's playing a board game together, it's playing cards together. 
Um, it's singing together. Um, you know, another couple, they had, um, I told them, use your, you know, use your child's karaoke machine, so they had a blast with it. Just yeah. having fun, it's being silly, and again, this um, increases our arousal and builds our connection, and it's recreating kind of that spark, that energy, again, the novelty and the newness that we have at the beginning of a relationship. So when, you know, reigniting a relationship, the key is to really shake things up consistently. Um, and in little ways, in ways that don't feel daunting or overwhelming um, in terms of time, in terms of logistics, or um, certainly in terms of money. So the next time you plan a date night out, think about the element of surprise, newness, mystery, and, and, um, and, uh, and, and novelty. And of course, having fun as well. So we wanted to leave some time for questions, if there was anything that came up. Yes, okay. So at the beginning, you talked about how when men come home from a day in their head, they're constantly solving things. Mm -hmm. um, what about women that are in the workforce that are single parents or you know have a high stressful job as well? Does that not affect the woman's um, physiologically? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, and what happens is the way that we build our estrogen back up or we get our serotonin back is by relating to other women, people we trust, people we can communicate with. What happens? What's um, happened in our society is that women have become more competitive with each other. So we don't find safety a lot of times in our, sorry, <laughs> in, our, in um, some of our relationships, so we tend to hold back. So then we become more independent, and we're looking to create interdependence, whether it's, so, so that's what we need to do in, with our stress levels, because that's what's going to build us back for femininity again, or we're going to think you're masculine, and that's not yeah. what the men want. And for men and women also, what happens is this when a day of, of multitasking, problem solving, uh, builds stress, increases cortisol in our system. Um, so for men and women, they have to find a way. And for women, it's connecting. For men, it's just taking some downtime to kind of de-escalate and to de-stress, putting you know both of you more in an optimal place to be able to connect in ways that are, are meaningful. So, but sometimes we just go silent, and then, then that just builds up, and then we get more irritated. Right, we suggest it. top off to go back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's, it hits all the marks. Yeah. Newness, yeah. The, the, the adrenaline going. Yeah. Challenge. Challenge, mm -hmm. right, absolutely. I think the key in a relationship is, you know, we talked earlier about, you know, we have to think the same about things. You know, I, um, I tell couples all the time, you don't have to understand, agree, or think the way your spouse does. You just have to recognize that it is the way they think about it. It's the way they operate, whether it's a personality difference, whether it's a biological uh, difference, it's understanding that. Um, because it's not about right or wrong, it's just about what works. And that's what I say all the time to couples. I'm like, if we are here you know, with a tally sheet and are trying to be right, I always, I, I always say this, everyone knows this at the office, I always say, do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? And the reality is, is um, depends on the day. Well, it sure does. Um, generally, though, you like to think happy. Um, uh, we've done a lot yeah. in general. Um, but the idea here is, it's about what works. And so, if you're curious, and if you're in, and if you're appreciative, you can say, Ah, you know, I'm getting information about you that's going to help me make this work. And it's a completely different mindset so it's not about right or wrong it's just about what works I mean, at the end of the day it's like I, I always say we all need to say a lot more of whatever in our lives mm -hmm. whatever whatever right I have a question so I know we have to say where I know it could be like the men women different points like they will think like oh, I think it's black you can say it's white even though kind of say the same thing or we have a viewpoint on that like the whole like black and white or this that kind of makes sense. Like, how do you either understand where they're coming from if they're not going to explain that, or kind of explain yourself without getting into them wanting to go into like a deep zone? Well, but sometimes if that um, makes sense. I think people need to understand that. What is it? Nine. It's about nine normally. Nine. Uh, the mountain. <laughs> nine. There's nine of them of areas that we're going to have to agree to disagree. Right. All of us. Like 
cannot resolve everything, and sometimes it is just saying we're going to have to take a break. So, but are you talking more just like just not necessarily under? You're both trying to say the same thing, but you're you're no, putting a block in how you're communicating it. No, I think it is the way systems are viewed, like mm -hmm. where the, they say one thing like why you feel this way, yeah, and then he feels like well why do you need to say because if I think black is white, like well no I'm not saying. You're that saying you have a that. different percep the perception right. of it. So I think that goes back to the idea here that, right. that we all things only have a meaning that we attach to them. Right. Okay. So you know, Laura and I can experience the exact same thing, and our our response to it is going to be different. And that's going to be based on again the meaning that we attach to it. So the cognition that we have that's going to determine how we feel, how we respond, and, and then what we and, and what we do with it. So I think in a, in a case like that, I mean, you're going to run into that quite a bit. I mean, it could be a similar thing, and you have a different take on it. And the reality is, is you're not trying to win anything, right? And so when you when someone say, "Well, why do you have to say it that way?" It's just like, well, I'm just um, you, know, you can just be like, I'm just expressing my way of looking at it, but yours is just as valid, right? So um, I, I think there's just got to be this acceptance that it's we're not the same. We're not designed to be the same. And like, can you imagine what your marriage would be like if you, you know, married the clone of you? yourself that would be right <laughs> you know, we naturally tend to uh, pick um, someone to share our time with that is a a not only a good balance so in other words they can um, exhibit qualities or have traits that are that we don't have and that oh, that we'd love to have or that we appreciate and sometimes it's also to have a corrective experience perhaps with uh, someone significant in our life growing up that that didn't quite go well. So there's lots of lots of expectations, right. you know, for with someone because we you know unconsciously think that they're gonna like heal us in some way. But um, I think to speak to that the best is just understand it's not about right or wrong. It's just about what works and curiosity and appreciation. I mean, just if you can take that paradigm and, and rephrase how you how you think about things, how you ask things, how you phrase things, you'll find. And the, yeah, you'll find that the response will be so, yeah, so different. Um, to be prepared for counseling, you said it was good to be self-aware. Mm -hmm. What are some good tools or questions to ask yourself to, to know if you are self-aware? You know what I'm saying? Well, I think the first thing you ask yourself is, am I happy? Am I happy with myself? Do you like yourself? You know, I, I mean, we have couples come in who are so focused on fixing a relationship or trying to focus externally outside themselves, not, not even knowing. So I think the first question is, is when you sit with yourself and you ask, am I, am I happy? Do, do I like what I'm doing? Do I like my relationships? Do I feel like I take care of myself well? Do people respond to me um, in a way that makes me feel good? Would, would, do, do people interact with me or do, do people, um, is their perception of me one that works for me? Is it one that I, that you feel is congruent with who you are? I mean, I think at the end of the day, there's got to be a personal inventory that just says how at ease and, and how at peace are you with just you, just you, you know? And we have, we have um, clients who come in who will frantically keep themselves busy um, because the idea of just kind of sitting with themselves, by themselves, is, um, is not a pleasant thought. Um, so I think it's the ability to slow down and just be with yourself and, and ask yourself, is what I'm doing working for me? Are you satisfied? Are you assessing the environment, are there any patterns that aren't working? Is there something that's happening in all the relationships and the common denominator issue? Can you ask yourself in your relationships, do you have repeating patterns? Do you have kind of what I call these tape recorder conversations, these issues that you go back to over and over again? Usually I say you have something more to learn about yourself in those than, than someone else. You're like, well, what, what are you doing? You're doing the same thing. What are you stuck on? What are your expectations of yourself or someone else? I, I, when I talk with clients, I talk about these kind of what I call these unspoken Ten Commandments. There are these, and we have them in almost every area of our life. It could be in our work life. It could be in our, our, um, um, uh, our personal life. It could be as a parent. So in other words, it's these, these um, commandments, these expectations that we say, if blank, then I am blank. So if people um, respond to me the way I want, then I know it's um, a healthy relationship. Or if my kids listen to me, I know I'm being an effective parent. Um, if my um, husband meets my needs, then I know he really loves me. If um, 
I get a, a, a big raise, then I guess that must mean I'm doing a good job. You find that in all these areas of our life that we have these kind of unspoken rules, and most often or not, if we really break them down and understand them, they limit us. They, you know, I had a client, I went, I went over those with her, and she was saying that um, what she wanted was to be happy. That sounds good. And I'm like, okay, well, what makes you happy? Well, um, if, you know, I have a good relationship with my family. Well, that sounds reasonable enough. And then we broke that down a little more. And what is a good relationship with your family? So she started to, like, unknowingly list these kind of unconscious ten commandments. She started with, well, um, they'll they'll, they'll mirror, they will mirror and match my efforts. Okay, so she said, if I if I extend and give, then they will give that back. Um, if I'm willing to spend time with them and, and I initiate it, then they will initiate it back. So she started to go down, and now you look at where has she put the power um, for her happiness in, in the unpredictability of, of how someone responds to her. And so she's taken all the power out of, away from herself, and this is what we see. Again, the focus externally rather than internally and what I'm doing, how I'm thinking, are the decisions I'm making and the way I'm relating to people in the world around me doesn't work for me. I mean, you know, you know when you feel content, you know when you feel frustrated. So you've got to, you know, spend some time to break that down. That's not always necessarily an easy thing to do on your own, um, which is why sometimes you'll go into couples counseling and someone who's skilled will be able to say, oh, you know, I think there's some benefit. And that isn't about shaming or saying it's your fault. But again, about that idea that if you're building a marital house, you know, you've got to have good support piece. You know, you can't worry about putting a third story addition on something when the foundation is crumbling. So, you know, you see yourself as, you know, foundationally, structurally um, important. And the question sometimes comes up, well, if I get healthy, I don't know if they'll love me anymore. So some people stay in an unhealthy situation or unhealthy state of being because they don't know what they would do without being in that relationship. So it's really having the confidence to really assess what you're doing, assess yourself, and, and know that you being happy is the most important thing because you have to live your life in that place, and I mean, in a self caring, not a selfish way by any means. Because you are going to want to give more, be more, do more when you're happy, and it will come out of a wonderful place and sense of guilt or shame. And initially, when I when I see um, individuals go through therapy, and if their um, partner or spouses aren't, it does initially create more of a gap and a discrepancy because the healthier you get, the more unhealthy people around you start to look. And again, that's whether it's at work, whether it's you know friendships, whether it's a spouse. So there is initially a bit of discomfort that comes with that, like but this the healthy this stuff yeah. isn't feeling so good anymore because we are now more aware. Once we you know know more, we can do more. So that's why it's important that you know we understand that. I tell clients all the time, you have to be ready for it. Don't pathologize it. Don't mean it doesn't mean that you have to exit everything and, and change everything that you're doing. It means that be prepared for it, and it's important that people around you also are healthy as well. And you can be a good advocate for that, you know, when you're getting healthier yourself. And you you want the one thing that's important to know: if you go get help. You would want the person, your yeah. significant spouse, to get help because they're oh, yeah. going to divide the marriage. If I get healthy, they don't. And you see, there can cause yeah. destruction of marriage. Yeah. And that's like a warning we say. Always. If they aren't ready for marital, they both need to do it for their really good relationship. Yeah. And that's not for that reason. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.